been really hard. And for a mother, I just, I haven't heard, like she has not called me since January 18th, 2021. She has not actually called my phone to talk to me and to reach out to me. And so to think like, as a mom, I don't know if she's safe. I don't know if she's okay. I want to just hug her. I just want to know that she's... Mm -hmm. But I, even if she were to tell me I'm fine, everything's fine, I know it's not fine. Yeah. Because nobody goes from the person she was. Anybody that knows her knows the kind of person she was. And if you ever, ever asked what is the most important thing in life, she would say her family. So to cut everybody off, you have to go back and say, if you were willing to cut everybody off, if this is your decision, who altered your thinking for that to be something you would want? Whisper in the night dark Footsteps in the backyard Shadows dance on stained walls Blood rust every night falls Fear grips like chains tied Chasing you in moonlight Eyes gleam with twisted clay No escape from me What up home slices, home fries, and homes of other varieties? If you are new, welcome. I'm Emily the Fine Art Medium. I'm a psychic medium who specializes in the paranormal and has a degree in social deviance. And the reason why I opened up in this specific way because it pertains to the topic of discussion in today's video, which is the TikTok cult 7M. For those of you who do not know what 7M is or 7M TikTok cult, I will put a clip up, of course, with the link of where it's from, briefly explaining what 7M is and the whole controversy. So here we go. What we do know is that around 1994, Robert, quote, saw the light of God's glory and believed that he was the one true man of God on earth. He divorced his first wife and eventually married Esther, who became, quote, the first woman of God. Then his family and his sister Catherine's family moved to Los Angeles to start Shekinah Church near Santa Fe Springs. And you might be wondering, why Los Angeles? Well, Robert hasn't specifically said why L.A. was calling to him to begin his religious journey, but it's really not too hard to figure out why once you know more about this guy. Around this time, the Seven Mountains Mandate had taken over conservative spheres, and the mandate instructs religious Christians to take over the seven mountains of mainstream society. These include family, religion, media, entertainment, business, and government, baby. It's the same mandate that televangelists use to justify collecting extreme amounts of wealth in the name of God. Supporters of the Seven Mountains Mandate include Donald Trump's spiritual advisor, Pastor Paula White. For angels are being released right now. Angels are being dispatched right now. Amanda, Atta, Atta, Rata, Teda, Bacas. We love her. Love, love. Rick Perry, Mike Pompeo, Teddy Cruz, Sarah Palin, Mike Huckabee, and many other powerful Christian conservatives. The Seven Mountains Mandate is basically a doomsday cult with the end goal of these leaders controlling the world and amassing wealth before the end of the world. While Robert Shin had publicly stated that he does not affiliate with the mandate, his actions in private sermons say otherwise. He created numerous organizations referencing Seven Mountains and discussed the importance of controlling media and gaining fame before his followers. Now, I might be just forgetting, but I don't think they explained in, they didn't get into Seven Mountains in the documentary. No, Because no. they never really explained why it was called 7M. Right? No. Unless I missed it. Yeah. I so, don't believe so. Which I don't think we have an exact, we don't for sure. We don't sure know for know sure know that, that it was that's... called. Seems pretty obvious though. Seven Mountains, 7M. Seven, seven million? I Could mean, be. <laughs> maybe that was his gold number. No, this dude wanted way more than that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't it know. It would make sense for it to be Seven Mountains. I think that's yeah, what it was. Yeah. Mountain. So for Robert, his mountains would be media, entertainment, and business. He wanted to make moolah and a lot of it. Go,
for him, LA was the perfect place to do that. Love Los Angeles. Mm, one of my favorite places. Are you being sarcastic? Absolutely. Can't <laughs> yeah, stand we, LA. We hate LA. Just there's a different Oof, aura there. Matter. I don't know. No, no hate to. Beautiful. Yeah. Some cool people. Yeah, lots of cool people. But there's a lot of. Josh and I always describe there's a lot of people in LA that are kind of. This is mean to say soulless is how we've described them. <laughs> There, it's just a lot of people, people are, selling their soul to the they're devil. They're lost in the sauce. That's the only way I can put it. Like they're they've like lost the, the chasing plot. chasing chasing fame. Yeah. Now you'll notice a pattern with me saying allegedly a lot. The person that we will be discussing for the majority of the video likes to sue people. So to cover my own butt, I will be saying allegedly quite often. So, without further ado, we're gonna just jump right into it. I do have clips as usual, and I will always put the video links and the cards in the descriptions down below. And, yeah, so, let's talk about the controversy of 7M and what's been going on in addition to the Netflix documentary. And a lot of the things that the Netflix documentary does not cover. So the big question is, why are people saying or calling 7M a cult? Maybe it has to do with the red flags associated with that group, such as the isolation from friends and family of their members, absurd commitments, people's change in personality, allegations of brainwashing, and so on and so forth. But in order to know exactly if it's a cult, we must understand what a cult is. So, a cult is generally defined as a group or movement that is often seen as unorthodox or extreme in its beliefs and practices typically centered around a charismatic leader, cults, often manipulate or exploit their members, leading to harmful effects on individuals and their relationships. And I'm going to go through 20 brief signs of a cult. So number one, authoritarian leadership. A single leader or small group holds significant power and control over the members. Number two, exclusivity. The group claims to have exclusive access to truth or salvation that is not available to outsiders. Three, isolation. Members are encouraged or required to cut ties with family and friends outside the group. Number four, manipulation. Psychological manipulation techniques are used to control members' thoughts and behaviors, which is like a big thing, especially in this group. Fear and intimidation. The use of fear, threats, or intimidation to maintain control and compliance. Number six, deceptive recruitment. New members are often recruited under false pretenses without full disclosure of the group's beliefs or practices. Number seven, rigid beliefs. A strict set of beliefs that are not open to questioning or debate. Number eight, total commitment. Members are expected to commit fully to the group, often at the expense of personal relationships and responsibilities. Number nine, us versus them mentality. A strong division between members and outsiders, often portraying outsiders as dangerous or evil. Number 10, emotional exploitation. Members may be subjected to emotional manipulation to maintain loyalty and compliance. 11. Public shaming. Practices that criticize or shame members for questioning the group or its leaders. Number 12. Lack of transparency. Decisions and practices are often kept secret from members, creating an atmosphere of distrust. Number 13. Subservience to leadership. Members are expected to submit to the authority of leaders unquestioningly. Number 14, ritualistic practices, engaging in specific rituals or practices that reinforce group identity and loyalty. 15, financial exploitation. Members may be pressured to donate significant 
amounts of money or time. Number 16, altered reality, a worldview that distorts reality, often involving supernatural explanations for ordinary events. Number 17, escalating demands, increased expectations over time regarding commitment, time, and resources. Number 18, dependency, members become emotionally and psychologically dependent on the group for their identity and self-worth. Number 19, suppression of dissent, any questioning or dissent is met with hostility or punishment. Number 20, exit barriers, difficulties or repercussions for members who attempt to leave the group, including ostracism or threats. Now, the thing with 7M and this group, it ticks a lot of those boxes. I would say, let's see, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, okay, all of them. <laughs> it takes all of those boxes, okay. So, while not all groups exhibiting some of these signs are cults, a combination of several characteristics can indicate a potentially harmful or manipulative environment. However, in this case, it literally takes all of the boxes. Now let's take a bit of a deep dive into the history of 7M and its founder, Robert Shin. Again, everything said about this person is all alleged for entertainment purposes only, I guess. Okay. I know that he grew up in, Cal in uh, Canada, but it's unclear when or where exactly he was born. Um, this cannot be confirmed, but he was likely raised in a religious household. I mean, it would make sense, right? And compared to other cult leaders who really mythologize their upbringing, Robert has really kept his childhood hidden for the most part. And we do know that he was likely married to his first wife when he graduated from the University of Toronto and worked as a doctor. But we don't know how long he practiced medicine or even the name of his first wife. So for the first several years, Shekinah stayed pretty small. It was comprised of the 15 original members, Robert's family, Catherine's family, and a few other recruited members as well. This included Daniel Joseph, who would eventually become Robert's informally adopted son. And all of these original members would eventually become high-ranking officials within the church, all wielding power and serving as intermediaries to Robert. But still, in the beginning, things were humble, you could say. Shekinah served as a religious center for Korean immigrants, actually, and they could speak to others in their native language, eat Korean food, and be treated like family. So it was a really comforting place for a lot of people in the beginning. And this attracted um, specifically Melanie and Priscilla Lee, and they joined the church in 1999 as teenagers. Melanie, Priscilla, and their third unnamed sister, who we'll get into in a second here, had recently moved to California from South Korea with their mother. However, their mother worked nights to support their family, but was also an alcoholic and abandoned the girls for weeks at a time. Priscilla, who was the oldest, basically raised her two sisters. Um, and it's important to note that Melanie and Priscilla did not mention their third sister in the documentary, so you probably hadn't heard about her. And she is the only one that's mentioned in the various lawsuits against Robert Shin. And we're not sure why she was left out of the documentary. I'm sure there's a reason. Uh, it could be that she's still in the cult. We have no idea. Still, the Lee sisters initially felt like they had finally found a family in a way. They could speak to Robert freely for guidance. And many members were around their age and from similar backgrounds. And they had people around them who they thought truly cared for them. Let's talk about Robert's sermons, especially early on. Well, they were pretty frightening. He stressed the importance of, quote, dying to yourself, which meant relinquishing yourself of all material things and cutting off familial ties to devote yourself to Shekinah and Robert. You die to your friends and family for things to come back and resurrect. According to Robert, this is how you can deliver your family to salvation. He would also explain that in hell, you are tortured endlessly by the sins you committed on earth and the pain you inflicted on others. He explained that you and your family are cursed to hell, and that is why you can't have any connection to them. But you're in luck, because as Robert is the man of God, you could save yourself and your family by devoting yourself to him and, of course, Shekinah. Soon, the Lee sisters only spoke to members of the church. Melanie had one friend, a young man named Mark from high school, who visited Shekinah. 
He said it felt less like an invitation to services and more like a recruitment. He said, quote, I'm not joining the church, but good for y'all. As the church's members grew and more people devoted themselves to Robert by giving him all of their material possessions and money, Shekinah finally had the wealth to accomplish Robert's true goals. Right after the Lee sisters joined Shekinah, the church expanded. It moved from its original location to one in Norwalk, California, where it still operates. And Robert then started on his first mountain, which was his biggest passion, probably still is, entertainment. Uh, He began his own public access TV show called The Millionaire's Club, which was later renamed The Billionaire's Club, which stressed the importance of financial success as one of Christianity's true aims. And by the end, Shekinah would create real estate companies, at least three media production companies, and smaller businesses like flower shops and coffee shops. And Shekinah members staffed all of these enterprises. And unless you were higher up, you did not control how much or when you were paid. And this is also when Shekinah introduced their hierarchy. Of course, at the top was Robert, the man of God himself. But at this point, most members believed every word this guy said and would do anything to please him and save themselves from eternal damnation. Directly beneath him was his wife, the woman of God, and she controlled the members' personal lives and took a specific interest in the women. Underneath her were the mentors and the sub-mentors who were assigned to particular members and they acted as intermediaries between the member and Robert because you could no longer just go up to Robert yourself, how it used to be in the early days. You had to have a mentor go speak to Robert for you. Robert also wanted to make sure that no secrets were kept because, I mean, that that's the cult recipe, right? No secrets from the top. Secrets from the members. Though. And separation from the members to the leader. Exactly. And he also explained that thoughts were either the product of God or the devil. Anything that pops in your head, it's either coming from God or the devil, and you need to report any thought that you have to your mentor. And you would immediately tell a mentor if someone else had told you something incriminating, that member would either be rewarded or publicly shamed by Robert during a sermon. That member would then devote themselves even more through financial contributions or labor to avoid eternal damnation. Uh, I don't know about you, but this kind of sounds a lot like Scientology and, like, their public shaming thing that they do. But also, like, if you think about it, they also have this thing where it's, like, you have to tell your deepest, darkest secrets and, like, they keep track of it and record of it. And obviously, I mean, in my opinion, to me, it's, like, they're saving that for a rainy day to keep you in line. And yeah, not good, not good. And telling somebody that any negative thought you have is from the devil or whatever, like, imagine the mental health decline in a person if they fully believe that. And you have people in this organization, in this church, that fully believe that. I can't even imagine how half of them slept at night. Because this is just from my perspective. I'm the kind of person where I overthink and overanalyze. And if you take somebody like that, that'll just send you down into a negative spiral. And it is no good. I am so surprised there aren't or haven't been any cases of people unaliving themselves due to the mental agony that they must have gone through doing this. Because not only could they not talk to friends and family or associate with them, like, who were they to talk to, talk to about some of these things? Like, you can't tell me that every single person that had every single thought went to someone above them to tell them everything that they were thinking. Do you many thoughts a person has a day? It almost feels infinite. So I can't even imagine. I don't know. I My mind is blown because I cannot comprehend the amount of agony the person or multiple people have gone through just with this rule alone. Okay, you know what else this reminds me of, too? 
if anyone is familiar with North Korea and how like their spy system works within their society. So they have spies. It can be people within your own family. It could be friends. It can be, I don't know, some dude, stranger down the street. Like people will rat you out if you talk anything bad about the leader or the government. So you could be talking to your mother and you could be like, oh, well, this guard yelled at me today. I think he's a piece of crap. And let's say your brother or your father heard that and they're a spy. They will go tell the government and your butt would be in big trouble. Like you would be so punished that it's not even funny. And I don't know, it kind of reminds me of that, but on a less um, severe scale, something in terms of that fits more into the society that they're currently living in. Because obviously you're not going to be able to like unalive somebody because somebody said something negative, whatever. But you get the idea. It's, yeah, that's freaky deaky. So not only did Robert control his members' thoughts, but he also managed every aspect of their lives. When the church bought numerous properties, members were forced to move into them with other members. Melanie and Priscilla were separated into two separate homes. Melanie lived with a group called the, quote, Glory Girls, which, I don't know, just something about that name. Agreed. And especially since was that. this was a group of girls between the ages of 13 and 16 mm -hmm. who were all living in this house uh, under the direct supervision of Catherine, Robert's sister. It just seems very, very sus to me, but... Members were still expected to pay rent, even though they moved you there. And they had to move all of their money into bank accounts controlled by a mentor. That member would work for a Shekinah-controlled business. They deposit the money into a Shekinah-controlled bank account, have the money moved by a mentor to cover rent, and then pay Robert directly. The rest would be left for the members themselves. While Melanie Lee was still in high school, she worked 40 hours a week at Shekinah-run businesses. After Catherine Shin finished moving her money around, she was often left with less than $100, not a day, not a week, a month. A month. Working, could you imagine working 40 hours a week? Mm -hmm. And at the end of that month, you have $100 in your account because you were giving all of your money. And it gets worse. To your spiritual leader. For adults with higher paying jobs, that number would often be even less. Oh, I'm sorry. If money and material things are the root of all evil, why would you take them from other people? Please explain that logic, Mr. Robert Shin. Um, also, for someone who claims to be a Christian, um, Jesus be rolling in his grave. For real, for real, though. Because, uh, yeah... Jesus was not about material things and money. And they even state this too in their podcast episode. But anyone who has even been brought up around, whether it's Christianity or Catholicism, or has even sniffed the Bible, would know <laughs> this principle in the texts <laughs> so i'm sorry but um try again try again and this highly controlled environment allowed power over every element of a member's life melanie lee was not allowed to attend college after graduation could never see a doctor and could not maintain relationships with anyone outside the church okay so if you know me you know that I'm literally at the doctor's once or twice a week because I have chronic illnesses and stuff. Okay, so depending on the type of doctor or whether or not it's like your first time going to a doctor, like you're getting a new physician, like a general practice physician, the question that they always, always ask, especially in like gynecologist offices, is are you in any danger have you been a victim of sa or any type of abuse that is literally one of the first questions so if you're somebody 
in that organization that's trying to get out and you're having problems, they could immediately just go to one of their doctors and be like, yes, this, 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 and this are happening. I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. And even if they didn't like admit to there being something wrong, you have some pretty smart doctors that can figure it out without that. And they could get law enforcement involved. Uh, Robert Shin would not want that to happen. Trust me. Well, obviously, because he doesn't allow them to go to doctors. So, yeah. And just saying, oh, because he is a miracle worker and can heal all things. I don't know if he actually believed that. If he did, okay, that's just more part of the narcissism, alleged narcissism he's got going on. And, like, the whole, like, I'm gad vibe he's got going on. But I think part of it, too, was to protect himself and to kind of better hide his tracks. Just my opinion. But meanwhile, mentors and influential members of the church would act without fear of repercussion, of course, including sexual assault against those beneath them in the church hierarchy. So I want to give a trigger warning here. We are going to be getting into the sexual assaults that allegedly occurred within Shekinah. So around 2001 to 2002, when Melanie Lee was between 15 and 16 years old, she was allegedly sexually assaulted by her Sunday school teacher, Peace Montgomery. Peace was nine years older than Melanie and responsible for picking her up and dropping her off at school. And since he held power in the church, high power, Melanie saw him daily and she felt there was no one she could turn to. And when Robert found out that Peace allegedly committed statutory rape against Melanie, he was allowed to keep his position within the church, of course. And instead, Robert and the church punished Melanie by telling her that she had been cursed by this sin and that she needed to devote herself even more to the church if she wanted to avoid hell for herself and for her sisters. This, of course, would not be the last time a high-ranking member allegedly used their power to justify sexual assault, and it would only get worse. And as we'll see throughout the next decade, Robert's attempts to break into Hollywood and be famous would really all be failures. The Millionaire's Club was seen as a key public access piece of crap that was only watched by members of the church during sermons. He wrote books spouting his philosophy, but still, these were only purchased by Shekinah members who were actually forced to buy them. So it doesn't say a whole lot, right? Yeah, and by 2008, Robert had allegedly extracted millions of dollars from his members. He had formed his first media company years earlier called Seventh Millennium. So that's what that M could mean. Yeah, Millennium. I guess it could mean that, yeah. I, I'm sure it's like for him. But he dissolved movies. He dissolved this business in 2008. So maybe it was like a remake of that. Yeah, could um, be. So he dissolved that in 2008 to make way for Imaginating Pictures, which was Robert's first real attempt to break into Hollywood. And guess what? Nobody watched his movies. Anyway, even though Robert was clearly desperate for fame, he didn't really need it because by exploiting his members, he could still afford luxury vehicles, mansions, and fancy dinners for those closest to him. He is definitely a big spender and likes to show off his money. However, if there was ever a potluck in the church, underpaid members were expected to use their own tiny allowances to pay for their food, drinks, and other materials. And at this point, Robert also made several deals with other shady evangelists, all of them who seemed to represent the Seven Mountains mandate. The old Shekinah website lists multiple pastors and church organizations, including Bill Winston. Now, Bill Winston was a megachurch pastor out in Chicago who defrauded hundreds of members by opening his own bank. Always a fun idea. In 2008, and his bank was shut down in 2013 after it hemorrhaged millions of dollars with no way to pay back the account owners. Sid Roth is another megachurch pastor who taught how the supernatural relates to Christianity. He was also accused of defrauding members and even claimed to be the second coming of Jesus Christ. Oh, so many second that. comings. So if you want to know if someone's shady or like a criminal or up to no good or you name it, there's one principle or rule that I like to follow personally. And you know what it is? Follow the monies. Okay, you can get a lot of information about a person by what they spend their money on. Plain and simple. 
And the fact that he's buying all these cars and all this stuff, all these luxury items. And, uh, yeah, look at the members and their suffering. Yeah, I don't know about you, but, uh, to me, that's Shady McShades over there. And the whole thing about the second coming of Jesus, here's the dealio. Whether you believe in Jesus or not, whatever your belief is, okay, um, Jesus is an ascended master, which means he's pretty much fulfilled all of the lessons that he needed in order to become ascended and a master, which means also that there's no reason for him to, um, reincarnate, if you want to put it in layman's terms. Yeah, there's no reason for him to uh, reincarnate. So when people say, I'm the second coming of Jesus or I'm Jesus reincarnated. I mean, common sense would tell you, okay, Mr. Crazy Pants. But no, seriously, like, I don't know. If someone's claiming to be something high and mighty and godly, first of all, Jesus never even did that. He's humble based off of the experiences I've had with him. And second, um, you wouldn't have to brag to people about you being a certain way because actions are louder than words and you wouldn't have to prove it to anybody. You would just go about your life and your actions would speak instead of your words. And I always like to go back on the... Um, quote that was in Game of Thrones where I forget who said it. If it was Tyrion or Tylen Lannister where they're yelling at Joffrey saying those who have to say they're the king are no king. <laughs> Essentially, in other words, people that are what they believe and say they are, they don't have to keep repeating it because they're so confident in themselves that they don't need to keep repeating and trying to convince people that they are a certain way or a certain thing. So, uh, Also, televangelist Jesse Duplantis, who we've talked about yeah, before. Yeah, we have. Yes, we have. You know, I've owned three different jets in my life. And I and use them and just burning them up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Was also supported by Robert Shin, even after he collected donations that only enriched himself when Hurricane Ida hit his parish in 2021. And when community members criticized him, he claimed that he bought hundreds of power generators for people that they could just pick up for free. But when the hurricane victims actually arrived at his church asking for the generators, he told them that they were all gone. Uh, which in reality, we all know, they probably just never existed at all. And the Trinity Broadcasting Network, the world's largest Christian TV channel, was accused of widespread embezzlement and covering up of sexual assault allegations after employees weren't paid and the owners bought, what else, private jets, baby. And Robert's Millionaires Club would sometimes air on Trinity, of course. But still, at this point, Robert was very much in the shadow of these other evangelists. You know what they say. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So it's like the people Robert looked up to, he's literally taking a page out of their playbook. Um, which, while he always wanted more fame, this obscurity and secrecy would sort of allow him to commit even more crimes against his members, as we alluded to earlier. So let's go back to Priscilla. When she first became involved with Shekinah, she and Melanie were both living in the U.S. illegally. Melanie got a driver's license a few years after she joined Shekinah, but Robert took it from her. He told her that the only reason she was able to get one as an undocumented person was because, quote, he prayed for it and she had to be forever in his debt. As Priscilla was 19 at the time of her recruitment and had already graduated from high school, Robert had her work two professional jobs she worked for a company outside Shekinah Monday through Friday, and the Shekinah operated Giga Financial on Saturdays. Sunday, her only day off started at 6 a.m. with all the other girls so she could attend church services. So that is a brutal schedule, man. 
Priscilla eventually lost her job with the outside company after they learned that she was also working for Giga Financial. Her contract explicitly stated that she could not have a second job. Shekinah members blame Priscilla for not keeping her Giga job a secret, and Robert allegedly punished her by giving all of her wages to high-ranking members. When she did get the money again, she was allowed to have no more than $40 a week. Priscilla was allegedly instructed to pre-sign dozens of blank checks so that a mentor or Robert could pay themselves or the mentors once Priscilla received a deposit. Priscilla and the other members had to account for and report every transaction they made, including a piece of candy. They also had to converse with their mentor before purchasing anything. And if the mentor said no, the purchase wasn't allowed. But at this point, years into her indoctrination, Priscilla felt that not only was Robert the only way to salvation, but Shekinah was the only way she could survive and support her family here in the U.S. There were some accidental miracles, too. Melanie struggled with a rash for months on end, and nobody could do anything to get rid of it. Then, allegedly, Robert baptized her in Laguna Beach, and the rash cleared up within a day. For them, this was proof that Robert was the true man of God, and for Robert... Perhaps he just got lucky. But still, the alleged abuse continued. When Priscilla began working full-time at Giga, Catherine berated her daily. The abuse got so intense that one day she even threatened to marry her off. And she was fearful that she was actually going to be forced into an arranged marriage, so she actually left the church in 2004. And for some reason, she did not mention this in the documentary, I'm not sure why, but she could not speak with her other two sisters during her time away unless the church approved of that. When they did allow a phone call, they yelled at Priscilla and told her that she had condemned them to hell and would curse them too if she remained outside of Shekinah. Priscilla did eventually marry an unnamed man in 2008, and meanwhile, Melanie stayed at Shekinah. And as we mentioned earlier, Robert did not allow her to go to college, and her days were spent working two full-time Shekinah-operated jobs and waking up at 6 a.m. on her days off for church services. And the services also got way more intense. Not only did Robert berate members and condemn them constantly, allegedly, but he began further stressing the importance of members garnering fame and told members that real followers would give 100% of their income to the church. 100%. There were even reports of waterboarding. Amen. I remember Dom standing right, kneeling there and getting waterboarded. Hallelujah. <laughs> who servants of the Lord who obey the prophetic leading and decide to just pour water all over somebody. <laughs> it only gets worse from here, folks, but Robert allegedly forced Melanie to divulge her deepest secrets to him and threatened that without complete submission, she and her family would be condemned to hell. And this is why she kept reinforcing that belief to Priscilla. She feared for both of their lives if she didn't return to the cult. In 2008, Robert announced that he was separating from his wife Esther and told the congregation that the position of the woman of God was open to any woman member he thought would be fit to marry him. He had already chosen a new wife, though, a young woman named Shirley Kim, but he kept this hidden from the rest of the church. In November of 2008, allegedly half a dozen young female members of Shekinah burst into a Sunday service, which I believe this was mentioned in the documentary. They accused Robert of allegedly sexually assaulting them, lying to them about potentially becoming the woman of God, and approximately half of the congregation left with them. But to those that remained, Robert admitted that he was a sex addict and that he too was fighting his demons to enter into the grace of God. When the members heard this admission, they felt that Robert had been humanized and became even more fervent in their belief in him. Melanie convinced Priscilla to rejoin the cult based on this belief. Melanie convinced Priscilla to meet with Robert, and it was during this meeting that Robert presented himself as her savior. He said that he had no idea what Catherine had put her through and promised that she would never be abused again if she rejoined the church. Priscilla was behind on her bills and Robert pledged financial stability if she left her husband, gave away her dogs, and rejoined the cult. Uh, I cannot compute. First of all, first of all, who in their right mind would A say bye to their significant other, their spouse, and their fur children. Okay, this this is no joke. If someone was like, or anyone was like, oh, you would have to get rid of your dog in order to work here or to live here or whatever. 
I don't go anywhere without my first son. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. He is my child. I'm offended. Okay? I am so offended. <sighs> Allegedly. Now, Priscilla ran two real estate companies for Robert, and by the time she left for good, she would have made millions of dollars in commissions, but she barely saw a cent of that money and was continually just paid that $40 a week, the same amount that she had been paid before she left the first time. And if she was paid, then the money was placed in an account that was controlled by the woman of God, who would just as quickly withdraw the funds to ensure that Priscilla was essentially always broke. Robert and other high-ranking officials told Priscilla that she would suffer significant consequences if she did not give all of her income to the church. And anytime she brought this up, she was punished and forced to do manual labor around the church. And in addition to running these two real estate companies, Priscilla was also expected to cook for the church and provide cold-pressed juices for Robert's wife every day. And she would have to pay for these groceries out of her own pocket. So insane. Priscilla was also forced to give all of her belongings, designer bags, clothing, jewelry, and even her car to the church. And Robert would even just randomly show, at, show up at her house sometimes and take all of her material things because his wife wanted them. Now, around this time, former church member Lydia Chung sued Robert and the Shekinah Church for the first time. Lydia, who was a member of the church from 1996 until 2008, alleged that Robert made her give the church, all of her material possessions, and her savings as well, which amounted to nearly $4 million. Unfortunately, the case was dismissed, and Lydia was ordered to pay Robert's legal fees, which he did waive, whatever. But basically, he just claimed that she was a angry ex-member who was actually in love with Robert. Lydia said, quote, I never wanted Robert. I knew who he was. He was broke, ugly, and married. So you might ask, what's paranormal about this situation? Or paranormal about Robert Shin? Well, you might think it's just some nut job who's power hungry or looking to manipulate and extort people for personal gain. However, that is just one piece of the puzzle. Before we talk about the paranormal, we must talk about psychology first because regardless of there being any type of paranormal element. It doesn't exempt him from any accountability and the psychological techniques that were used in order to get him where he's currently at. Okay, guys, just because I say something might have a paranormal element, I am not erasing all of that person's accountability in any means. Everything that the person has done, they are held accountable 100%. Okay, get it, got it, good, let's move on. So, let's look at the psychology be behind cults. The psychology behind cults and their ability to lure individuals involves a complex interplay of social, emotional, and cognitive factors. Here are some key psychological mechanisms and strategies that cults use to attract and retain members. Now, obviously, some of these might repeat based off of the 20 signs of a cult, but I digress. So, number one, desire for belonging. Many individuals seek connection in community. Cults often provide a sense of belonging, offering members a supportive environment that can feel like family. Charismatic leadership. Cults usually have charismatic leaders who are skilled at influencing and captivating followers. These leaders often present themselves as having unique insights or abilities, fostering deep loyalty among members. Number three, psychological manipulation. Cults employ various psychological tactics such as love bombing, that's just one example which is excessive affection and attention to draw people in. This creates an emotional bond and makes newcomers feel valued and special. Number four, cognitive dissonance. Once individuals are involved, cults may create situations where members experience cognitive dissonance, holding conflicting beliefs. To resolve this discomfort, members often double down on their commitment to the group. Isolation, number five. 
Cults frequently isolate members from outside influences, including family and friends. This isolation can reinforce the group's beliefs and practices, making it harder for individuals to leave or question the group. Number six, gradual commitment. Cults often employ a step-by-step -step approach, gradually increasing demands on members. This incremental commitment makes it difficult for individuals to back out as they have invested emotionally and socially. Number seven, manipulation of fear. Many cults instill fear about the outside world or potential consequences of leaving the group. This fear can create a sense of urgency to stay within the group for safety and security. Number eight, promise of transformation. Cults often promise members personal transformation, enlightenment, or salvation. This appeals to individuals who may be struggling with their identity or seeking purpose in life. Number nine, us versus them mentality. Cults create a strong in-group identity promoting an us versus them mentality. This fosters loyalty among members while demonizing outsiders, reinforcing the idea that the group is the only source of truth or the leader. Number 10, rituals and practices. Engaging in rituals or group activities fosters cohesion and shared identity. These practices can create a sense of belonging and reinforce commitment to the group. Number 11, social reinforcement. Positive reinforcement from fellow members can validate an individual's beliefs and experiences, making them less likely to question the group's teachings. Number 12, use of language and jargon. Cults often develop their own language or jargon that creates a sense of exclusivity and belonging. This can also serve to confuse or alienate outsiders. Number 13, exploitation of vulnerability. Individuals going through difficult life transitions or facing emotional struggles are often prime targets. Cults exploit these vulnerabilities by offering support and solutions. Understanding the psychological mechanisms behind cults helps to explain why individuals may be drawn to them and why they can be so difficult to leave. The combination of emotional fulfillment, cognitive manipulation, and social dynamics creates an environment where individuals may lose sight of their original beliefs and values, becoming deeply entrenched in the group's ideology. One thing I did forget, I think, yeah, was I want to add, like, for number 14, like, making it where you are reliant on the group. I don't think I said that in this segment, but it's like they make it where the person is relying on the person or group specifically financially, so it makes it even harder to leave. But like up front, it looks like it's a good deal and it's helping them kind of fill in some holes that that person might be feeling at that time, especially if they are looking for fame and wealth and if you dangle that in front of their face and you promise oh we're gonna put you in a creator house with a bunch of other creators and like you'll be able to live there cheaper than if you were to live somewhere else and you get to work and play and I don't know do collabs easier than if you lived on your own and it just makes it sound very great and then it gets to a point where the demanding of money and finances and resources, um, it gets to be a lot. In Robert Shin's case, while I do believe he allegedly had some questionable underlying personality traits, whether they were learned from his environment during his adolescent years or genetically inherited, I suspect that those negative traits were intensified by his alleged attachment. <laughs> I should put like a voice clip over that every time. Anyway, while it is difficult to prove what happened in his childhood years, especially since not much is known about it, I suspect that he had suffered multiple types of trauma, allegedly, such as psychological and or physical traumas during his development stages of childhood and young adulthood, which may have revolved around money, physical or mental insecurities, 
potential abuse, physical or mental, bullying, etc. The reason I suspect these things has to do with his personality traits and past behaviors as documented in allegations in multiple public court documents in addition to patterns perceived through most recent events. Based on multiple witness statements, allegations, and recent events, it's safe to say that while it may have been intended or not, at the end of the day, the organization of 7M and its intermingling with the Shekinah Church, even though they are formally separated entities, regardless of the paper trails and money, being somewhat combined informally, can be considered a cult based off of the multiple criterion that it checks off, thereby making Robert Shin a cult leader, allegedly. And if you look at the general patterns at what makes a cult leader, you will find yourself traveling in a complete circle in some cases because many of the criterion that are used to manipulate and coerce cult followers can be used to make a cult leader due to the ability of the leader to relate to their followers. This is a psychological tactic that has been employed by many in part is what makes some cult leaders charismatic. Most importantly, it is necessary to look at some of the key traits of a cult leader and pick apart why they have some of these traits in the first place, where they learned as a result of finding a coping mechanism to a trauma. Is the trait a mirrored behavior from someone of importance to that person, etc. Questions such as these must be asked. So let's look at this. So those that have become cult leaders typically have innate charisma. Many cult leaders possess a natural charisma that allows them to attract and influence others. This charm can manifest in their communication style, confidence, and ability to connect emotionally with followers, as I previously stated. Psychological traits. Certain psychological traits such as narcissism, grandiosity, and a strong need for power can predispose <laughs> can predispose, there we go, individuals to becoming cult leaders. These traits may foster a belief in their own superiority and a desire to control others. Life experiences, personal experiences, particularly traumatic events, can shape an individual's worldview. Such experiences may lead them to seek meaning or validation driving them to adopt extreme beliefs that resonate with others. Crisis of identity or purpose. A significant life crisis or existential questioning can prompt individuals to seek a new identity or purpose. This search may lead them to develop radical beliefs that attract followers who are also seeking answers. Ideological conviction. Cult leaders often develop strong ideological beliefs that they believe are unique or revolutionary. This conviction can provide a sense of mission and justify their actions, attracting others who resonate with their vision. Social isolation. Cult leaders frequently isolate themselves from dissenting voices, creating an environment where their beliefs go unchallenged. This isolation can amplify their extreme thinking and solidify their authority. Manipulative skills. Many cult leaders are adept at manipulation, using psychological tactics to persuade and control followers. This may include love bombing, emotional exploitation, and instilling fear about the outside world. Cultural and social context. The broader social and cultural environment can play a significant role in the rise of cult leaders. Economic instability, social unrest, or widespread disillusion can create a fertile ground for charismatic individuals to attract followers. Reinforcement of beliefs. As followers become more committed, cult leaders reinforce their beliefs and loyalty through emotional manipulation or rewards. This creates a cycle that further entrenches the leader's authority and influence. Cognitive dissonance. Cult leaders may experience cognitive 
dissonance as they promote their beliefs. To resolve this discomfort, they become more entrenched in their ideology, often leading to increasingly extreme positions. The birth of a cult leader is often the result of a complex interplay of personality traits, life experiences, social dynamics, and contextual factors. While not every individual with these characteristics becomes a cult leader, the combination of these elements can create an environment conductive to the emergence of a charismatic and influential figure who attracts a devoted following. Understanding this process can provide insight into dynamics of cults in the individuals who lead them. Now guys, this is literally just a brief overview. I could literally go on for days and nitpick each of these things and just like explore a new world but we don't have all day here so I'm kind of just trying to move quickly here through these things as like an overview with all of that being said with trauma in mind in addition to certain negative traits and behaviors I believe this allegedly made Robert Shin a perfect candidate for a negative attachment I suspect he has had this negative attachment for a very long time, but it was only until he was extremely vulnerable through the many years of stress trauma, allegedly, and poor mental health, allegedly, <laughs> piling up to where this entity was able to sink in its teeth deeper. At this point, this is when he received a message from the negative entity masquerading as a godly figure that used Robert's deepest desires to convince him he was a messiah who could save other people from the devil through certain principles and teachings. This idea played on his alleged desires to be someone of importance or famous along with the perks of that such as being wealthy and loved. He wanted to be famous so incredibly bad that he made many attempts at that through the production of several films and music videos, etc. The entity played upon his heartstrings and desires so well that Robert couldn't see past the illusion. But that's what lower vibrational beings do. They lure you in with the things you want most, but at high cost. Oftentimes, it is things such as wealth and fame. Those are the most popular among people, but it's not always the things and is different for each person for the most part. For Robert, I believe the cost will be high and much worse than the temporary benefits that he's been getting. For example, I suspect his fame will be turned around on him, making him famous for all the wrong reasons, which kind of actually already is starting to happen. And all the money he has gained over the years will be lost either from lawsuits, fines, you name it. I foresee him spending a lot of time in court and potentially going to prison. Not only that, the universe has a way of balancing itself and all or many of the wrongs that he has made will be righted in some way, shape, or form. Perhaps a few new legislations or laws will go into effect because of the rise in cult activity. Or at least, even if the cult activity isn't technically significantly increasing, it's becoming more noticed. And the comment that was made on the Mile Higher video where Kendall and Josh briefly mentioned the bit about people in LA selling their soul for fame and fortune isn't that far from the truth. There are many that do sell their soul for fame and fortune, whether that's through direct communication with negative entities or through life choices that erase everything about a person that makes them unique and human in order to be someone they are not. Either way, it all ends the same with a yucky attachment that wreaks havoc on the person's life and feeds off of the negative energy that has been brought upon them from negative consequences of their influenced or non-influenced actions. That is not to say that being rich and famous will bring attachments or evil. It's only when done the wrong way. People who stay grounded don't abandon who they are as a person along with friends and family that don't get sucked in by greed and the attention usually for okay as long as they are also taking care of their mental and physical health. 
However, it is easy to see how 3D concepts such as fame and fortune can suck a person in, especially if they have come from a background where they were less fortunate than their peers or lacked the necessary attention in their younger years and or major childhood developmental stages. Those things can create a void in a person and at first, while it may seem fun to have those things, it can become addictive, creating temporary boosts, mainly in dopamine, which continuously become sought after to maintain that feeling of euphoria. Eventually, the person runs out of resources to fill that void or turns to more destructive ways to fill it. So I asked my guides what type of attachment Robert Shin allegedly had or has if there was a specific entity or spirit involved. And without skipping a beat, Claire, audiently, I heard Samael. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's spelled S-A-M-A-E-L. I heard this loud as day. There was no questioning it. And other than knowing that he used to be an archangel, I knew nothing, so I asked my guides to provide me some information. I don't like going to direct sources in situations like this, especially if there's a potential risk factor. I like to keep myself safe, okay? And so I just asked my guides to provide me the information. So one thing I kept seeing was a snake in reference to him, along with like the little hat things or headwear that the priests wear. And I didn't know why at first. I didn't know why. So I pressed on and found out that Samael was indeed an archangel that had become one of the fallen angels due to his part in corrupting men, aka humans. Samael worked closely with Bilal, another fallen angel, to do this. In other words, Samael is one of the arch demons. Is it arch demons or arch demons? I don't even know. And is a devil entity. The thing with these types of beings, they are very good manipulators. Due to their ability to hold their previous angelic form to masquerade as a being of light long enough to deceive a person. Additionally, they never work alone. When you have high-ranking demons or devils involved, you also have their legion or those that work under them, assisting in the mission or task. Very rarely do devil entities themselves do the dirty work. Normally, it's a being lower than them to do it with much oversight from those above. People with a lot of reach, fame, or influence on other people tend to be great candidates for the more severe types of attachments due to their ability to affect so many people. Charismatic leaders, politicians, actors, musicians, etc. are great examples, or in this case, allegedly, Robert Shin. He held a position in the church that he created. Well, he was a leader of it, but he had a lot of pull and a lot of resources. Now, some things that I found about Samael, there's a lot of symbology in his name, and he's been referred to as other things such as Satan and Lucifer, although Lucifer and Samael are two different beings. Though Satan, when you dissect the word and its meaning, it means adversary. And Samael has similar meanings to that and it gets really confusing, okay? So it makes it like, is he different from Satan? Is he the same? Like what's going on with that? The problem is as humans, we are creators, which means we can manifest pretty much anything we want. That includes our thoughts and the energies that we put off can also manifest into things. We call those thought forms. Now, the thing with this is that if you put a crap ton of energy towards a certain idea, let's say, for example, the idea of Satan, um, you can create a being whether it originated from heaven or from a higher ascended realm and then became a fallen angel and then nasty nasty or it starting out as a thought form 
and then just being nasty nasty at the end of the day Satan and Samuel still end up kind of as separate beings even if they somehow I'm not saying this is true but even if somehow they were the same exact being from the beginning it doesn't matter because of that creation thing that we do right and the uh and the ability to create thought forms, you're still gonna have another separate entity that's nasty and that's Satan. And so still you're gonna have separate beings. So yeah, I thought I would just like explain that real quick because that was one thing I was like, um, okay, but like, you know, everyone's gonna have their different perspectives depending on religious texts. They're all gonna say different things, whether you're Jewish, Christian, um, Islamic or what's the proper word? I don't even know. But there are so many different variations of similar stories and it gets hard to differentiate and know what's truth or just symbolic mythology, if that makes sense. But I did have a long conversation with my guides that is about a page long I shrunk the font to like nine or ten points but I'm not gonna go through it all because this video is already long but I might just put it on patreon because there's a bunch of stories on here or questions that I had that they answered and it might answer some of your questions if you have any and yeah, a lot of stuff. A lot of crazy things. Origin of man, humans, whatever you want to call it. We have answers to that in there. So, yeah, we'll leave that to Patreon once I edit the grammar and whatnot. Because right now, I was literally typing from my notes and then channeling at the same time to see if I missed anything. And I... It ended at like 4,444 like words, which is crazy. And I'll insert the proof here because I send it to my friend Megan. Hi, Megan. To be like, yo, look what just happened. That's not a coincidence. But let's continue because based off of the information I got, it validated some of the things that I had also found. So, yes, validated that he was an arc angel that did fall due to corruption and he is now a demonic entity who is presented as handsome and angelic with stereotypical seraphic traits. He has a deep understanding of politics and being a diplomat which means he knows and understands the subtleties and deceptive dances that comes with this territory. He knows how to manipulate and twist the minds of others and he can shroud his enemies with confusion and fill them with misinformation. He is one of power, physical strength, core awakening, war, revenge, and vengeance. He can reveal the secrets of breaking curses and he can bring the enemies of those who work with him to ruin. He can also help those who work with him to bring down their enemies and end their friendships and connections. I don't know, there's a little bit of similarities here. He has been written about as one of the Watcher angels who fell from heaven to copulate with humans. His wives being the four goddesses of sacred prostitution. He is one of lust and deep sexual desire. He is an angel who understands the needs and wants of lust and he himself is known for his appetites and dark desires. He works closely with Belial. Now this chunk of information, while like I said earlier, this information was validated, but I did pull the specific phrasing off a website and guys I will list my sources down below um, if I've gotten anything from other sources just to be transparent but yeah the thing is here like it or not Robert Chin allegedly has a negative attachment that's really bad and being the fact that he's got a lot of reach and affects the lives of many people. He is prime candidate for this type of attachment. And honestly, I think 
from his upbringing and the traumas that came along with it, allegedly, is what brought this upon him. And as you know, like, I do talk about what attracts attachments and stuff like that. So many people may question, like, how can these people fall for such an obvious, like, red flag or, I don't know, just, like, something so obvious. But the thing is, specific people are targeted based on their vulnerability. And if you're someone that is smart and very manipulative... If you find the right person who's undergoing trauma or vulnerabilities of any kind, it's easier to sweep them up. And it's sad because they are victims, even though they believe they have free will. And it's part of the reason why the court system can't really do much about it, because people, that especially adults, have free will and so if they believe that they're doing something of their own accord, there's not much anyone can do about it. Some of these people are not in distress, even though the families are. The people that are the members of this group, they're not in distress or appear distressed, especially on the social media accounts. Um... So that's why it's kind of very difficult to do anything about. And until you get someone that is in it and it calls for help to help them get out of it, not much can be done. It's so sad and I feel bad for the families and all of the other victims that this person, allegedly, but according to the court documents which have been shared from the Mile Higher podcast channel, um, there's a lot of messed up allegations, especially regarding to S.A. And at one point him admitting that he has an addiction to, um, there, I'll just do that. I don't know what I can and cannot say at this point on YouTube. YouTube's been acting really weird in terms of, like, pushing videos out to people and so on. But, yeah, it's like... But think about it. What are some of the traits of the entity that is attached to Robert? Um, he's very, um, promiscuous and has a lot of, uh, sexual desire... And someone that's an alleged addict of the snoo snoo, if you know what I mean. If you get that reference, I'm proud of you. But, um, yeah, I mean, think about it. This entity has four goddess wives of prostitution. And he is one of lust and deep sexual desire. Um, I mean, hello? Hello? One of the things he got in trouble for had to do with copulating with humans. Hello. He can also help those who work with him to bring down their enemies and end their friendships and connections. Hello. Like, this guy is separating people from their family and friends. Like, if we were going to have an entity be a cult leader, I mean, honestly... CMIL would probably be a really good one. Just saying. But, yeah, I mean, other than that, there's not much else to go through. I feel like Netflix did an okay job. Obviously, they had to leave a lot of information out because they didn't want to get sued. Though, if he hasn't already, I'm sure he's going to try to sue. I haven't looked to see if he has but I suspect he's going to because Netflix has got the ka-ching, ka-ching, bling, 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 and he likes his monies, so I wouldn't be surprised. But yeah, this guy, it ain't gonna end well for him, especially on the karma spectrum. Even if what he 
did he perceives as good uh yeah he was uh manipulated influenced by that attachment and it's sad because the amount of people he has negatively affected but again that's what the entity wants he's got a lot of reach so not only does he affect the members but the members friends and family and everything that comes as a result of that also kind of feeds into that negative energy feeding spectrum so yeah guys <laughs> this is a big one welcome to the first video of shocktoberfest 2024 i hope you thought it was interesting i thought it was interesting i learned some new things but yeah guys if you made it this far and watched the entire video thank you you're awesome and uh i will see you next no, not, yeah, tomorrow, I guess, because we're doing it every single day. But uh, peace out, home fries and home slices and slices of homes and homes of other varieties. Tonight, only six TikTok dancers are still under Robert Shin's banner, Miranda Derrick among them. She denies being in a cult and says she's not a victim. My next guest is free of Shin and 7M, but says it wasn't easy. Aubrey Fisher joins me live now. Aubrey, thank you so much for being on. What was your experience? Uh, my experience with uh, Shekinah was very interesting. Um, I started hanging out with my friends, B Dash, Vic, and everybody else. We we're doing a lot of TikTok videos, Instagram videos, um, and then COVID hit. And so, long story short, uh, B Dash was hanging out with his friend, which is Isaiah, which is Robert's son. And then he started hanging out with him, going to his house like every single day. Um, and then later on, you know, they started having meetings. And so then Reno started, you know, my other friends started tagging along with them. And then my other friends started tagging along with them too as well. So it was like a one by one type thing. And then so I was like, okay, fine. Let me just, you know, see what this is about. You know, let me, let me check it out myself and see how things go. And then, you know, I just started coming around more. Um, and then one time, uh, Robert said something about, all right, we're going to start a management company. I was around, this was around a time when I wasn't even a part of the church yet. I was just still going to meetings. I was still hanging out with my friends at the time, but they were a part of the church and I wasn't. Um, and then, so that's how 7M came about. Um, and then that's when he was telling me, Hey, if you really want to be a part of this, it, it depends on how much like, you want it. Yeah. It seemed like he was taking 20%, which is not an unreasonable management fee, but things started to change, as I understand mm -hmm. it. Like, all of a sudden, you're being manipulated into being part of the roommate uh, club, and then freedom started to disappear. And then at one point, as I read it, mm -hmm. you had to die to your family members in order to be committed to the church. I mean, when did you start to realize, this isn't normal, this is a cult? Uh, I started to realize it when everything started shifting, when all the um, media started pointing out, like Shekinah, like Robert Shin, and like 7M, like this is, this is something fishy, like everything was being exploded, like around social media. Um, and then we, we had uh, meetings, and then we had services, and then we would change the dates, like say friends will have meetings on, on Wednesday, we'll change to like a Thursday or a Tuesday, or if we had like a service on Sunday, we'll change to like a Saturday. So everything was switching up. Uh, and then he wanted to have everybody like go see our families, talk to our friends, make sure that everything that you do post it so that way people can see that everything is normal and that everything just looks like we're we're not in a cult at all, basically. Um, I, I want to so ask you. That was when I was like, okay, this I is kind of fishy. Let, let me ask you if I can about Miranda. You know, she's your dance partner. I think in this video and a mm -hmm. couple of other ones, um, Miranda's posting videos now. Uh, that show her dancing mm -hmm. with her mom and, and her sister. But we've been hearing that Miranda's family is desperate mm -hmm. to get her to, to come home or reach out to them. So are those videos real? Uh, I cannot speak on that part because we're not there. Um, but most definitely there is something going on because that is something that they would do to make everything seem like everything's normal. But do you suspect that there, I mean, it, it just seems odd. On one side, you've got the family desperate for her to, to, to come home and talk to them. And on the other side, she's, she's showing videos mm -hmm. that they're together. It just doesn't equate. It's, it's more so it's more so a thing where you have to show it in a way to where everything seems normal, but it's really not. It's still like 
they're still fighting to have her back because we know that she's she's still there and she's still being controlled by Robert and going by what he says and how he how he orchestrates everything it's just, it's a whole situation so that is why she's still talking to her family to this wow. day um but yeah. Aubrey I'm so sorry you went through this and I, I sure hope the best for Miranda and her family I'm very thankful for you being here I appreciate it